Once upon a time, a little less than a century ago, there was a beautiful, young, brilliant girl that was born in faraway middle America. And she would come to be one of the most brilliant women of her time. But when she was seven years old, she was raped by her mother's boyfriend. And she was not only brilliant, but she was courageous. And if you've ever experienced anything like that, you know that it takes courage to say anything to anyone about it. And she was courageous, and she told her mother what had happened to her. And when her uncles found out, they caught the man, and they beat him to death. They murdered him. This little girl's name was Maya Angelou. And she, when she heard what her uncles did, and that that man lost his life because she told, she thought it was her fault. And she developed an anxiety disorder called selective mutism. And she didn't speak for five years. And during those five years, as she grew into her high school years, into her middle school and early high school years, she, though she was quiet on the outside, she tended her soul on the inside. She took heed to her thoughts. She forgave much because there was much to be forgiven. In fact, years later, she would be quoted as saying, it's one of the greatest gifts that you can give to yourself to forgive. So forgive everybody. And she, even though she was silent on the outside, she watched, she read people, and she learned to read, and she read a lot of books. And later she would come to write several books, and she came to speak six languages. She was brilliant, and she was courageous. I have a feeling about this generation. I've been watching for it for a long time. When Ken and I were in our late teens, there was, and some of you have heard me share this in prophetic ministry class, when we were in our late teens, there was a great move of the Holy Spirit that went across America and literally went around the globe. And I won't go into all of the details, except to say that that generation at that time was the largest in number of any generation before it. There was this move of the Holy Spirit that happened in denominational churches. We went to Catholic churches and the Holy Spirit was moving and nuns were speaking in tongues and priests were speaking in tongues. And there was, I grew up in the Methodist church and there was a great move of the Holy Spirit in the Methodist church, uh, many denominations. and. On the street, hippies were getting saved, and there was a, and becoming the Jesus freaks of the day, and you know, and there was this amazing move of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that your generation, Gen Z, is the largest in number of any generation before it? I've been waiting for you to arrive. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to move again in such a way that it will make a difference. I believe that as we wait on God and we ask him to speak to us and to move through us, that it can make a difference. Several years ago, I went to a women's conference in Wenatchee, Washington. I just was reminded of this this morning as I was continuing to pray about this. And uh, in this uh, women's conference, by the way, about your generation, 26, there's 20, of Gen Z, 26% of the global population is Gen Z. In just three years, 27% of you will make up the workforce. 
around the globe. Are you significant or what? I'll come back to that conference in just a minute. What I want to tell you more about Maya Angelou is after this happened to her, and this was during these years that she wasn't talking, she and her mother were walking toward uh, to catch a, a streetcar. And as they were walking, her mom was talking to her. Again, she paid attention to everything. And she said to her, Maya, you know what? I think that you are the greatest woman that I have ever met. She's saying this to just a young woman, a young girl. And she began to list great women of the day. And she said, no, you know what, baby? I think that you are the greatest woman that I have ever met. And Maya, as they boarded the streetcar and she looked to the inside paneling on the streetcar, she asked herself, I wonder, just suppose I really am somebody. Just suppose I really am somebody. And I want you to think, Gen Z, just suppose you really are somebody. What do you think God might do around the globe if you began to get a hold of that, regardless of your circumstance. Now, the Holy Spirit will require of you that you take heed to yourself and that you tend your soul. Maya tended her wound with forgiveness, and that's why she could say, forgive everybody. And she tended her mind her soul with study and memorization. She was brilliant. Several years ago, when I was in Wenatchee at a women's conference, there was the, a church was hosting this women's conference. And these women were so dynamic that I noticed on breaks as we walked downtown, Wenatchee's not very large, and we walked downtown and I noticed that the mannequins in the stores were dressed modestly. Those women had such, made such a difference in their community that even in the store windows, they knew who their shoppers were and they dressed the mannequins accordingly. I wonder if we're modeling the world or if we're modeling to the world sometimes. You guys, 26% of the population you are. I wonder if we could even change mannequins. <laughs> I don't know. Today, I, I want to talk to you about tending. Tending yourself spirit, soul, and body. 25 times in the Bible, from Exodus to 2 Peter, it tells us, take heed to yourself. 26 times, 25 times. Uh, to take heed is the same as tending. In the Hebrew, it means to hedge about as with thorns. Have you um, ever thought about around you maybe putting a, like a blackberry hedge, a hedge around you that has thorns so that the world can't get closer than they should. To hedge about with thorns so that you're penetrating them, they're not penetrating you. It means to guard, to protect, to attend to, to pay attention to. You know, the ancient life was attending life. Moses encountered God at the burning bush when he was tending a flock. Abel tended flocks in the fields. I don't know where God's going to call you. Jacob tended sheep before he got a wife. Hmm. Um, David tended sheep before he became a king. Hmm. I wonder if he tended middle schoolers before he became a lead pastor. Aaron tended the tabernacle lamp to keep the light going. The New Testament shepherds tended the flocks before the angels came and announced to them that the Messiah child was born. What's the next revelation, you know? 
Isaiah 40 and verse 11 tells us that he, ten, he tends his flocks like a shepherd. You know, the Lord tends us, and Psalm 23 tells us all kinds of things that when he tends us, how he takes care of us, he leads us, and he causes us to, you know, uh, just he's, to sit down with him, and he wants to dwell with us. Well, and as we look at how he tends us, it teaches us how we should tend others. You know, our world is one that struggles with the monogamy of our attention. You know, we no longer attend to anything because we're attending to everything. How do we give singular focus? And that was in the worship this morning, to give singular focus. I, you know, sometimes we're so busy tending to our phones or tending to everyone else in the dorm or in the youth group that we don't take time to tend ourselves. And the Lord would say to us, there's a starving and thirsty generation that needs us to be a light, to be an example, and to tend ourselves so that we might have enough to tend them, enough left over. It isn't merely that we're distracted. You know, it's that we privilege everywhere and everything over the right here and the right now. You know, and I appreciate your attention this morning, and I, I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving and going to begin to speak to you about what area he wants you to focus on this semester and this school year. As you start this school year, what area would he want you to take heed to, to pay attention to? Uh, you know, uh, you want to tend to your relationship with the Lord? You want to hear God's voice? Well, you're going to have to tend to that relationship. Take heed to it. You want to have a healthy soul and healthy relationships with others? You're going to have to tend to it. Do you want to have a healthy body? You're going to have to tend to it. Uh, you're going to have to take heed to it. You know, in this age, it's paramount that we tend to the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. We must do it for their sakes. We must tend to ourselves for their sakes. You know, Jesus tended to himself. When he grew up, uh, he matured as a whole man. Think about it. As he came to earth, his body grew, his mind grew, his heart for his heavenly father grew, his relationships with people grew. He pondered he paid attention. I think when Jesus was in that carpenter shop, he was going to school on humanity. I think he was going to school on people. Uh, he allowed all the data that he was receiving from his environment and his time with the Father, uh, and he grew into maturity. Jesus practiced good self-care. You shouldn't think it's selfish to take care of yourself. He tended to his personal needs, you know. When he needed some time alone, he took it. When he felt hungry and thirsty, he made it known. And, you know, he didn't allow others to control his agenda. He didn't shrink from asking his friends to pray for him when he had a need. Wow. Jesus also <clears throat> told his disciples to come to him for rest. Why would he have said that if they didn't have need? Jesus is saying to some of you this morning, this semester, this school year, I want you to tend to Sabbath rest. And if you can conquer it in this next six months or in this next nine months, you've just taken a, a step of growth that's going to serve you well for the rest of your life. Because you settled in, it cemented into your soul how you need to rest. Maybe that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. You know, um, we need to, now I'm going to break it down, spirit, soul, and body. We need to tend to our spirit. In this age, perhaps what's most at risk is our ability to tend to our relationship with God. We need to give the monogamy of our attention to God. The scripture calls this single-heartedness. When you have your devotions, do you give Jesus single-hearted focus? 
Have you ever thought about why God told Moses to take his shoes off when he was at the burning bush? We know that God said, look, Moses, this is holy ground. Do you know that when you and Jesus meet together, it's like holy ground? And he said to Moses, take your shoes off. Uh, I read a book this summer or last spring uh, called After Doubt by A.J. Swoboda, and I highly recommend the book. But in the book, he gives this illustration of every time he would come home from work, and he's a pastor and a teacher in a, um, um, a university. Anyway, every time he came home from work, his little boy, Elliot, would say to him, Papa, Papa, take your shoes off. And he said, I never could figure that out. It took me the longest time to figure it out. He said, I asked my friends, do your kids tell you to take your shoes off when you get home from work? And why did they say that? And so one day, he wasn't getting any good answers, couldn't figure it out. And so he asked little Elliot, Elliot, why do you want me to take my shoes off? And he says, oh, Papa. He says, when you have your shoes on, you have somewhere else to go. But when you take your shoes off, you have nowhere else to go. So, Papa, take your shoes off. And I wonder if our Heavenly Father, Papa, would take his shoes off, or would say to us, take your shoes off. You know, when we come in to talk to him, you know, there's just no shortcut for knowing him. You know, uh, it takes time. You can learn about him by taking some Bible classes, you can learn about him by reading your Bible uh, on your phone. You can, that's all, you know, you can learn about him in a variety of ways, but to know him, take your shoes off. Take your shoes off and spend some time. Let him know, I've got no place else to go right now. And maybe some of you need to set an alarm on your phone that says time to go to class now. But, you know, it's like, we need to sometimes take our shoes off. You know, in the Hebrew, uh, to know means to experience. It, it means to do something more than um, just intellectualizing it, just knowing about him. It means to experience. The Hebrew word yada means to know. It means to encounter, to experience, and to share in an intimate way. I think sometimes when we are tending to our spirits, we need to take the earbuds out or put a please do not disturb sign on our dorm door and take our shoes off and tune in. Uh, Billy Graham said, you know, God doesn't want an apartment in your house. He wants the whole house. He wants, he wants focused uh, attention. We need to sit and we need uh, to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can suffer from what's called today, I think sometimes we suffer today from what's called reflective poverty. We rush in and we talk to God, but we don't take time to meditate and reflect. And we become poor in our reflection of him. Reflective poverty. You know, uh, are you poor in that way? You know, we need to give God the monogamy of our attention. I think, again, as I pondered this, sometimes I think we don't tend to our relationship with God because sometimes when we have in the past, he hasn't shown up. He hasn't seemed to have answered us. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. And we, he feels very far away. So we're like, I don't know, the last time I really tried to talk to him day after day and I even fasted and prayed, he just never really showed up and said anything to me. So I just don't, I don't do it anymore. I want to say to you this morning that God's silence is not the same as God's absence. You know, we want to feel God, but God's sensory absence is not his actual distance. Sometimes God reveals true intimacy with us by not talking to us like we're toddlers anymore. You know, adults, you know, I, I can feel Ken's thoughts right now. We've been married many, many decades and many years. And he doesn't even have to always say something to me for me to get it and to know it. He can read my body language, I can read his. You know, God's 
sensory distance is not actual distance. So don't run from him. What about your soul? What about your soul? So when, when God is silent, realize he hasn't abandoned you. Continue to lean in. What about tending to your soul or taking heed uh, to your soul, your mind, will, and emotions? So if you think, okay, Glenda, my, my spirit is good. I'm good. I don't feel like the Holy Spirit's talking to me about that. My devos are great. All right, let's check your soul. How's your soul doing? Tending to the mind, will, and emotions. And I'm going to include relationships here. You know, good self-care, again, is a godly thing. So having healthy relationships and friendships is actually tending to our souls. The soul that is left unattended becomes isolated and imbalanced. And if there's anything that COVID taught us, this is one of those things, is that when we were too isolated, we got imbalanced in our thoughts and sometimes felt that we weren't worthy and then we got real depressed. You know, it's like too much isolation is not good. The soul that has genuine friendship is the soul that is balanced. Why? Because scripture says that friends sharpen our countenance. We need our friends to speak into our lives. So is God talking to you this morning about, you know what? I need to do a little better at taking heed to my relationships and to my soul. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, he who no longer listens to his brother will not listen to God. Are you listening to your brothers and sisters? Are they saying things that you don't like? Maybe God is talking to them and through them. We need to tend to our people. You know, people are made in the image of God, not phones. <laughs> well, now, if you get a text from me, uh, you know that it's from God. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, our phones can be vehicles for people to speak to us, right? I'm just teasing you, you know, but it's like we have to remember that it's people that are image bearers of God. So we need to tend to our relationships. Now, balance with that is crucial, all right? Because we, in our humanness, tend to become like those that we hang out with, right? Uh, there was an obscure monk by the name of Chaim who gave advice to the Christians that were under his care. And his advice was, don't live with the heretics. He didn't say, don't know the heretics. He didn't say, don't love the heretics. He said, don't live with the heretics. In other words, watch the influence of your friends. You know, sometimes, some of you, uh, your personality type is so, you're so full of empathy and compassion for people that uh, the influence can begin to go the opposite direction that you initially intend. When our personal compassion for others overrides our covenant connection with Jesus, we risk deconstructing our faith one plank at a time. And we live in an age right now of deconstruction. And it is healthy for you to look at your faith and understand why you believe what you believe, line upon line, precept upon precept. But when your compassion overrides your relationship with Jesus, you can begin to deconstruct your faith one plank at a time because the influence goes in the wrong direction. Does that make sense? I see some of you nodding like, yeah, okay, got that. That makes sense, okay? Then we need to um, tend to or take heed to our you know, our mind, will, and emotions, not just our, our relationships, our emotional, intellectual input. So let me just uh, say this. The human soul withers under the avalanche of distraction that this culture provides today. Is your person withering under the avalanche of all that comes through the internet today? 
My goodness, think about how much we get distracted by, and I'm not against the phone. I have a phone. I use the phone every morning. You know, I read my Bible on the phone. I mean, you know, it's, we use the phone, right? But it's like, I want to make sure that those pop-ups aren't going to keep coming up so much that I miss and I wither under the avalanche of all of that and that my soul withers because I don't take the time to take heed to what the Lord is saying to me in my mind, will, and emotions. So let me just uh, give you a little checkup here and see if the Holy Spirit would speak to you about one thing or the other. Um, chart, I challenge you on these things. Chart your emotions, okay? Over a period of time, see if there is a pattern to your emotions. Do you have more dark motions than light motions? You know, chart those emotions and see how you're doing. Uh, what about your music? Evaluate your music and the impact of your music. Honestly, objectively, listen to all kinds of music and then evaluate how it affects you. Don't lie to yourself or rebel against your parents or their style of music. No, evaluate it objectively and honestly and see how it's affecting you. Uh, what about your reading material? You know, our souls need tending through our intellectual growth and our reading. And if you're not a reader, I want to challenge you to start reading at least a book a month. Start there. And then before you know it, you'll be reading more and more. You need to read to grow your intellectual growth. How are you doing? Uh, take heed to your soul. There was a German Jewish theologian by the name of Franz Rosenwig who compared uh, modern Jews to uh, divers in the ocean who maintained um, let me, uh, the that they maintained their growth by the oxygen that was already stored in their tanks. And then when that was out, they died. And he said, you know, you can't just go on the oxygen that you have right now. You need fresh oxygen tomorrow. You can't just go on the books that you read this summer. What are you reading right now? Okay, I'm stepping back. I'm letting the Holy Spirit tell you what you need to take heed of because it's something different for all of us. What about social media, view, uh, video viewing and game playing? You know, our souls can pay a price for uh, when we throw around our attention. Augustine uh, said that uh, we could lose the virginity of our mind by what we allow to go into it. When we are promiscuous with our attention, we are promiscuous with our soul. What are you allowing to come into your soul? You know, there, maybe you need to fast this for a little while. Maybe the pop-ups have become too much. You know, maybe you need to put some guards on it. I don't know what the Holy Spirit would say to you. It's going to be different for each one of us. But when we're promiscuous with our attention, we're promiscuous with our soul. What about your per personal activity? Um, does it edify? You know, at the University of California, Irvine, uh, they asked uh, the psychology students, uh, they asked them to ask several students on campus to take one photo a day uh, for, I think it was for 100 days, to take one photo of either themselves smiling or something that made them smile or a person that made them smile. And when they came back and did their surveys, they found that 100% of those surveyed said that their mood improved. So do you ever take time to just stop and take a picture of something that makes you smile? And that could be the beach, that could be a flower, that could be a friend. You know, Jessica stole my phone the other day and took a picture of herself and Caleb's smiling. I think she likes to do that, you know. But you know what? I looked at it last night and it made me smile. You know, it's like you want to improve your mood. Take heed to your soul by maybe doing something as simple as taking some smiling pictures. Practice gratitude. 
that's another thing that will tend your soul is saying, mm, nope, I'm not going to complain about that. I'm going to say, I am thankful for, for every one dark thought you have, uh, speak three positive things that you're thankful for. I don't know, just the thought. Okay, spirit, soul. What's the Holy Spirit talking to you about? Because we're going to pray about it here in just a bit with somebody so you can get some accountability and say, I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to work on this this semester. What about your body? Da, da, da. Okay, we don't like to talk about that. You know, good self-care means that you must learn to attend to your own legitimate needs. That is not being selfish. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, your body is the house of God, right? I mean, the house of the Holy Spirit. It's the home for your spirit, right? Ern Baxter, who was a speaker uh, in generations ago, he's with Jesus today, but he said the duration of your usefulness for God may depend on your godly stewardship of your physical body. So the next slide, that's, that's the quote. The duration, think about it. Now, you're young. Almost everyone in this room is young, except for Ken and I, I think. But uh, it's like the duration of your usefulness. How long do you want to be useful to God? Do you want to quit being useful to God when you're 25? When you're 30? And I know genetics plays into this, but some of it's taking heed. Thank you. I got some amens over here. That might have been from Ken because he's the oldest. Okay, anyway. No. When you take good care of the temple or the house that God has loaned you, you honor him. God has loaned you this body. Whoop, whoop. He loans us our friends. He loans us our studies. He loans us our abilities to read and to listen and to feel and to sense. He loans us these things. And when we take good care of what he loans us, we honor him. Ooh. Dr. Gary Smalley in his book, The DNA of Relationships, says, as far as I know, no one has yet to discover any Bible verse that commands us to stay fatigued for Jesus. You know, sometimes we're so busy ministering to people that we exhaust ourselves, right? And so, that's okay sometimes. We need to be willing to go the extra mile. But if that's what you're doing every night in the dorm, you are the last one to go to bed because you're ministering to somebody. Did Jesus want you to be fatigued all the days of your life? I don't think so. Okay. So to tend to my body... I need to have sufficient rest and sleep. 80% of us need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. 10%, five to six hours, 10%, nine to 10 hours, okay? Most of us fall right in there seven to nine hours. And you're looking at me like, are you kidding me? Do you know where I live? Do you know how hot it's been? I know you got all kinds of questions for me. But just do your best. And by the way, feast and famine doesn't work. You can't live on three or four hours Monday through Friday and then make up for it on Saturday and Sunday. Your body just doesn't, doesn't get it. You can make up a little bit by sleeping in a little bit later or something uh, but on the weekends. But we need to develop some good habits. What about sufficient exercise? You know, many of you are athletes and you're already working out, getting ready for basketball season and you're in soccer or you're in volleyball and you're already exercising and that's fantastic. But all of us need some, God built our bodies to move. Do you know movement is a gift from God? Ken's mother was paralyzed for a season of her life and she didn't get to move much. Movement is a gift from God. So I don't know if the Holy Spirit's talking to you about moving a little more. What about proper nutrition? <laughs> what are you eating? What are you putting in that house that God's loaned to you? You know? Okay. Let me close with this. Maya Angelou once said, do the best you can until you know better. 
And then when you know better, do better. Now the Holy Spirit has spoken something to you this morning. Spirit, soul, or body. And he doesn't usually tell us to work on everything at once because then we fail at everything. But what one thing do you think you and the Holy Spirit might think you could work on this semester and this school year? And I give you that quote because I want to ask you this. What if you really are somebody? What if the Holy Spirit really does want to move through you? What if you really are somebody? And the, thank you, the band can come back. Do you know that even though Maya had selective mutism for five years of her life, she was the first female, don't let me lose you, right here. They're coming back, you're used to it, it's okay, right here. She was the first female poet in history to speak at a presidential inauguration. She tended to her soul. Um, when she spoke at this inauguration, part of what she spoke was, but today the rock, referring to Christ Jesus, the rock cries out to us clearly and forcefully, come, you may stand on my back and face your distant destiny. You know, another thing that Maya Angelou said was, if you're always trying to be normal, you'll never know how amazing you can be. Let's stand. We must be intentional about taking heed. We must be intentional about tending. I'm prophesying to you with my eyes wide open. You have the potential to be amazing. So why try to be normal, average in your spirit, soul, and body? Why not become amazing? And if you become amazing each semester or each year in one thing, think about what you could be four years from now. Let me ponder that. If you focused on one thing this semester or this school year and you got really good at it, even if it was just Sabbath rest or if it was just exercise, or if it was just quiet time with Jesus. What if you really are somebody? <laughs> this generation is lost and it's deconstructing and they need you. But they need you not to just preach at them, they need you to be an example for them. And if we don't do it ourselves, we have nothing to give away. You know, if you can't do it for yourself, do it for them. And if you can't do it for them, do it for yourself. And if you can't do it for you or for them, do it for the cause of Christ. Do it for Jesus. Uh, Colossians 1.27 says it's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. I would love for us to determine afresh that we're going to work on one thing that we feel the Holy Spirit wants us to work on this semester and this school year.